morning. We welcome you back on this Pentecost or Sunday after Pentecost as we begin that season of the church here in which we focus our attention or God focuses our attention on how he calls us to be his servants. We're going to see that today especially. Um, one, of the, one of the things that um, we talked about as a worship committee was sometimes it's nice to mix things up a little bit and so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to go back to uh, the supplement. Don't take it out yet. <laughs> we will use that just for the order of liturgy, and we'll use the, the regular hymnal for the hymns and the song. So you will just need this. They should be located at the ends of your pews, and we will use divine service. One is our order of service. It's on page 15 in the front of the supplement. So that being said, <laughs> while you're rummaging around for those, um, take out your hymnal at this time, and we'll start with our first posted hymn of 9 to 11.
Please stand. I invite you at this time to take out Christian Worship Supplement, and we will turn to page 15 as we follow Divine Service 1 this morning as our word of worship. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil, and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. sacrifice for all our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now in the peace of that forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. We turn our attention to the Word of God as printed in your service folder, 
In our first lesson, as God calls sick sinners to serve him, in our first one, we see the calling of Moses, who, well, for lack of a better word, was unfit in his own mind to be called to serve, and yet those whom God calls, he equips. He does not call those who are already equipped. Exodus 3. Now Moses was shepherding the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, a priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in blazing fire from within a bush. Moses saw the bush was on fire, but the bush was not burning up, and so he said, I'll go over and look at this amazing sight to find out why the bush is not burning up. When the Lord saw that Moses had gone over to take a look, God called him from the middle of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Moses said, I'm here. The Lord said, do not come any closer. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. He then said, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his faith, face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have certainly seen the misery of my people in Egypt, and I have heard their cry for help because of their slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering, so I have come down to deliver them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out, up out of that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now indeed, the Israelites cry for help has come to me. Yes, I've seen how the Egyptians are oppressing them. Come now, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. <laughs> but Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you. This will be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will serve God in this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers is sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What should I say to them? So God replied to Moses, I am who I am. He also said, You will say this to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also told Moses, say this to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is how I am to be remembered from generation to generation. This is the word of the Lord. We'll sing together Psalm 119c. Now when you get to that psalm in front of the hymnal, you will see that uh, the verse in the uh, chorus, or the refrain rather, are on the left hand side, and the verse by itself is on the right hand side. So follow 119C.
Our second lesson from 1 Timothy chapter 1, we note Paul tells us that again, being called to serve is not because he is qualified, but rather unqualified and receives his qualification in Christ. I give thanks to the one who empowered me, namely Christ Jesus our Lord, that he treated me as trustworthy, appointing me into his ministry. He did this even though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man. But I was shown mercy, because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. The grace of our Lord overflowed on me, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and worthy of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But I was shown mercy for this reason, that in me, the worst sinner, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his unlimited patience as an example for those who are going to believe in him, resulting in eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, to the immortal, invisible, only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of our gospel. We read this morning from Matthew's Gospel, our sermon text as well, chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. many tax collectors and sinners were actually there too, eating with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Well, when Jesus heard this, he said to them, the healthy do not need a physician, but the sick do. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. In fact, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. The gospel of our Lord. We continue on page 19 as we confess our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. Page 19. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Of all that is seen and unseen, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Please be seated. We'll join in our next posted hymn, Hymn 578.
are serving us, that we who are served by our Savior might in turn then be brought from the sickness of sin and sorrow and death into joy and delight as we are privileged and called to be his servants. When you heard the gospel lesson this morning, when you go back to the thought that Jesus went and called the tax collector to follow him, did the thought ever call, occur to you or come to mind, that's kind of a bad business deal. That's not one that I would do. I mean, think about it. If, for example, you were looking for more people to help out in the NICU, for example, the, where all the babies are born and they're vulnerable to diseases and sicknesses, would you go and try to find somebody who's sick and get them to help out? How about uh, if you're fighting a war and you're fighting a battle, would you go to the opposite side and go find some soldiers and tell them to come over there and, hey, give us a hand and fight against your own people? It's almost as though Jesus was doing that today. It was almost a dumb business practice that would have been doomed to fail from the very beginning. Almost as though Jesus was looking for sick sinners to serve on his behalf. The most nonsensical thing you could possibly do. But as you and I have come to learn in our study of God's word and as the Spirit's grace works on our hearts, God's ways are always backwards from the way we tend to do things or expect them to be done in everyday life. We're going to see how he does that today. In the heart of this man who... Well, he's not accepted by society. As we read in Matthew chapter 5, he's a tax collector. And, and if he's a tax collector in the day, to go out and be one of those guys that goes out and, and takes money from people, I'll get into that in a little bit, you're already being written off by the temple police. We know them as the Pharisees, the, the political police of the day and and the religious regulators, when they saw a tax collector, they pretty much said, well, they're just on hospice waiting for hell. They're helpless. We can't do anything to help them anymore. They made their bed. They chose that occupation. They're going to hell, and there's no point in even associating with them and all the other sinners and the riffraff with them. So... If you're a tax collector, you're automatically shunned from the temple. If you're a tax collector, you're doing something else, too. You're hired by Rome, and Rome, of course, is an enemy nation. And you're commissioned to go, and you're, you're going to collect, let's just ra- use round numbers, okay? You're going to collect $100, and you're going to give that $100 to Rome. But if you collect more than $100, and it's perfectly legal and legitimate in that day to do so, then the rest is yours. So do you think that tax collectors were poor? Uh Uh-uh. They made, they raked it in, and they lived a wealthy lifestyle because they could. Now the thing is, they were twice traitors. Not only traitors because they were collecting for Rome and enemy nation, but they were twice traitors because they were collecting from their own people. That's why nobody wanted anything to do with them. That's why even the people who were not Pharisees wanted nothing to do with them. They were pretty sick. Now, as much as we might look at a tax collector and and say, well, they had it coming to them, that's the life they chose. Have you ever talked to someone who's stuck what I mean by that is um, the, the stereotypical is, is the, maybe it's somebody who's, who's caught up in, in prostitution. You talk to them and they're like, I know it's not right, but I can't get out of it. I don't know what else to do with my life. I've been doing this my whole life. I don't know what else to do. Somebody who's addicted to drugs. I know it's not right. I, I just can't get away from it. I don't know what else to do. Or I've done so much harm already 
There's no way I could possibly make up for that, and so I'm stuck. The only way I could possibly uh, find any joy is just to make more money and spend it on myself. Maybe you're someone who's struggling with that. Maybe you know someone who's struggling with that very thought, that very concept. There's a lot of guilt that's carried around, and that's what makes Jesus stopping at this man's booth even more extraordinary. He didn't have to. He could have done what everybody else did and walked the other way. He could have shunned him. He could have called down curses on him. He could have joined in with the Pharisees. But he doesn't. He goes and he says the two words, you come follow me. Now, let me just stop here for a second before we get into this. Normally, someone who's sick will go and find the doctor, right? The doctor doesn't go finding the patients and say, all right, you're sick, you come here, I'm going to see you, and we're going to make you better. But that's how Jesus works, isn't it? He knows the hearts of all of us who are sick with sin, and he comes to us, and he sees our need, and he sees how guilt-ridden we are, how many missed opportunities we've had, how many things we've done that we didn't want to do, and how many relationships we've destroyed, how many times we've turned our back on him, and yet he still comes up to our little tax booth of guilt, and he says, you come and follow me. Now, I don't know what the look on the tax collector's face must have been, but I can't imagine it was anything, but are you are you, are you sure you got the right guy? Are you sure you want me? His reaction is, is just, it, it's absolutely a miracle. Matthew's his name, his Jewish name is, is Levi. He gets up and he follows Jesus. Those little words, that little phrase, Matthew gets up and he follows him, it's loaded with all kinds of background. We can't assume that Jesus, this is the first time that Jesus met him. That's just kind of, it's nonsensical to assume that. What we can assume is that maybe this guy had heard all kinds of things that Jesus was doing, had heard his word, had seen the miracles, but yet was just kind of stuck. And in the back of his mind, he said, there's no way that this guy would ever want me to do something for him. There's no way that the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the Messiah, would want me to serve in his kingdom. And you and I, at times in our life, we might look at the, some of the things that we've said and done, and, or maybe not done. Maybe it's, we didn't do the right thing with our kids. We we talked too harshly with them. We didn't raise them right. We made a lot of mistakes with them. Maybe it's with a spouse or, or a relationship. And boy, if I could do it all over again, I would. And yet, no, you wouldn't. <laughs> We're sick sinners. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a job or a, maybe a, a dumb choice that changed the course of your life. And you can't go back and undo it. And you keep dwelling in that tax booth of guilt. But then why are you here this morning? Why does Jesus then come to you and reach out the hand and he says to you the same thing? Hey, you, sick sinner, come follow me. No, not on Facebook, not for a day, not for when it's convenient. But like Matthew did, just leave it all behind. All the guilt, all the what-ifs, all the baggage, and all the wealth and worldly attachment, and you come and follow me. And by the Spirit's grace, that's why you're here today. That's why you keep coming back here. That's why you, God, through you, he comes and he works faith by the Spirit's working. And through that word, he 
actually gets you up off your feet and you do something that's completely nonsensical too. You leave this world behind in your mind. And you'd rather lose all things rather than Christ who bids you to come and follow him. You and me, six sinners, who he calls then for a purpose and that is to serve in his kingdom. I'm not sure how often we step back and realize what a privilege that really is. The Savior of the world? God himself? The one who exists outside of time and in eternity? The one who is has power over anything and everything and he chooses you and me sick sinners to serve alongside of him <laughs> maybe even in your mind you say well, that, well that's a dumb thing to do God I'm going to mess this up and we do and yet that hand still reaches out doesn't it of grace you know the one that has the scar on it if you look very closely, you can see that in the picture. <laughs> the one that has the scar, the nail-scarred hands that removed every one of your sins. The one who told you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are my child, as the water dripped over your heads. The one who still equips you through word and wheat and wine, as you and I have the privilege again today, to leave this house forgiven that we might then give and serve as we've been given and forgiven. There's a really big gap in our story for today. I don't know if you caught, caught it, but all of a sudden we go from Jesus telling this man to follow him, and then he gets up and he follows him, and then suddenly we're at Matthew's house. What? How would we get there? We can only assume there must have been a conversation that happened between Jesus and Matthew. Maybe there's some forgiveness and some absolution, some confession, repentance, some uh, Jesus reassuring him. And the reason, again, this is a stroke of irony too. Jesus said, come and follow me. And where does Jesus end up? Not at his own house. He follows the tax collector to his house. So now who's following whom? Physically, Jesus always comes to us, doesn't he? Now, why is he there? He's going and rubbing elbows with the, with the riffraff, isn't he? It's a political move, isn't it? No. No way. Jesus isn't interested in what people think of him. He's interested in the sick sinners that this now saved sinner wants to bring also to meet this doctor of souls. Now, Jesus does something here that I would caution you or me to do, and that is to go into the same place where all these six sinners would assume, knowing you're a Christian, that you shouldn't be. Give me an example. So let's say that uh, someone's in a bar and they're all getting drunk and you go in there and you follow suit. Are you going to talk to them about Jesus while you're drunk? What's that saying? Uh-uh. So what are you doing? Well, Jesus is one who can see hearts, which you and I can't see. The dangerous thing is that we walk a fine line between joining in with the sin, not joining in with the sin, but yet loving and sitting down with the sinner. And that's what Jesus does. He does it perfectly because we don't. So when he sits down with the sinners and he sits down with the tax collectors, we have an example of what happens. You know, those temple police, they show up. And they don't talk directly to Jesus because he's intimidating to them and because he can just pretty much throw them off a ledge <laughs> with his conversation. And so they go after the disciples. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Let's go find the weakest link. Let's pick off the weakest ones. Let's pick off the disciples and let's convince them not to follow this Jesus guy because he's not doing the right thing. He's not being loving. He's being a bigot. He's being racist. He's being unchristian as defined by those who don't even know Christ. 
Does that sound familiar to you? But you and I can fall into that same category, can't we? Hmm. How easy it is for the little Pharisee in us to well right up and step on the opportunity that Jesus gives to serve. Well, Jesus isn't going to let this one go. And that's where the question comes in. Or excuse me, the answer comes into the question. The healthy, he says, do not need a physician, but the sick do. Now, I don't know about you, but this statement is just kind of like, yep, Captain Obvious, it's not the healthy that need to see the doctor, it's the sick. Why does Jesus say that then? Because he's hitting the Pharisee right between the eyes, who thinks, I'm fine, I don't need Jesus' help. And while the sick sinner is there, humbly kneeling, falling before Jesus, and saying, I need you so badly, and I can't do anything about it. I'm so sick, I, I can't, again, I can't, I can't see what the expression was on Matthew's face. But don't you kind of assume that that's the way it had to be? That that's his response because he invites Jesus over and he wants to know more and he wants to tell others and he wants to be a servant of Jesus because he was once sick and now Jesus has made him well. And only Jesus. So then he turns to the Pharisees, Jesus, and he says, go learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You know what Jesus is doing? He's connecting for us the Old and the New Testament with a quote from Isaiah 6, verse 6. And when Jesus is quoting this, what he's doing is he's bringing them back to the Old Testament when the people in in Hosea's time, all they were doing was doing the right thing, going through the motions. They were doing the sacrifices. They were showing up for church. They were giving their offerings. They were volunteering, maybe. They were doing all the right things when inwardly they were sick. Their hearts were far from him. And they were not showing mercy, as God does, as they were shown mercy from the very God who loved them. And this is the point that Jesus is making to the Pharisees and the disciples and to the tax collectors. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. I said it before, right? Jesus doesn't call those who are already equipped. He equips those whom he calls. <laughs> Sorry, but I haven't always been a pastor. And those who know me in my previous life know that, nope, you haven't always been a pastor. And yet, just like the Apostle Paul, he equips the ones he calls. It's not those who are righteous that need a better hotel to sit in and tell themselves, look at how good we are. Now, the church should be a hospital, shouldn't it? For six sinners in need of a Savior who seeks us out, who comes to us in the darkness and doubt and worry and want of our past. And he keeps reaching out to us and he keeps saying, hey, you, Come follow me. No, not because you're good enough. Because you aren't. Because you desperately need me to make you well. To take that sin away and to create that burning desire then to serve others with the same message of salvation of the one who bled and died and rose and who's coming again to bring you to be with him forever in eternity. That's Jesus' call to you. What a blessed one it is for six sinners who get to serve the Savior. Amen. Please rise. Now may that peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll respond with create in me.
Please be seated once again. It's now the opportunity we have to serve our Lord with our offerings, giving him our first, our best. If you would, please make use of the friendship registers located at the ends of your pew in the red folder. It's also a good time to prepare your hearts to receive the Lord's Supper. Use those personal prayers inside the front cover of your hymn. Please stand for prayer. Lord God, King Eternal, we give thanks for your many mercies, which you've so graciously showered on each one of us. Grant that we would be mindful of your magnificent gifts and the vast ocean of your kindness. Most of all, we give thanks for the great love which you've given us in your Son, Christ Jesus, whom you sent for our salvation for the forgiveness of sins through him and for our deliverance from his power, by his power, from the dominion of death and the devil, and for the promise of eternal life. Lord, grant that as you first loved us, so may we love you with all our heart, soul, and strength. Teach us to walk as those who are obedient in your holy commandments. As we wrestle against the powers of spiritual darkness and all our temptations, Give us the strength we need to win the victory of faith and continue in service to you. May the sunshine of your love descend on our homes. Grant that our children may be reared in thankful devotion and all their days walk in your praise. We ask, a loving Father, for your mercy and grace on all those who face adversity, especially this week we remember William Bruss, who is the grandson of Ryan and Sue Bruss, who is currently in the ICU, diagnosed with Lyme's meningitis. Lord, as you bless little children and held them up as an example of faith, hold your hand of blessing over this one who is ill. If it is your word, if it is your will, then, that this illness linger, assure William and his parents of your loving presence in the time of hardship. Lord, we entrust this family into your loving hands. Heavenly Father, as we look to your Son, Jesus, we see how you showed your faithfulness to us and demonstrated your great love for us. Hear our prayers on behalf of Tony and Ariel Vargas, who were married here yesterday. Fill their marriage with your abiding grace, direct their eyes to Jesus, and so help them fulfill their marriage vows, remaining committed to each other as to you all their days. 
We ask that you grant all these petitions, Lord, and whatever else we may ask in the depths of our own hearts, for the sake of him who died, that we might ever live with you. For it's in his name that we then join together, as he has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We continue on page 22 in the front of Christian Worship Supplement. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right, so we do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is, with them, to shepherd his flock until he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join in their glorious song. Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you.
Please stand and we'll continue on page 26 with the song of once again with this holy supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit as one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. You may be seated as we close our service with our final hymn, 896.